Welcome to our live webinar titled Communication Strategies to Improve Challenging Behaviors for Minimally Verbal, minimally verbal Children. Thank you for joining us. My name is Cindy Wright and I'm a program manager for the Child Neurology Foundation and I'll be moderating today's presentation. The Child Neurology Foundation's vision is a world in which all children affected by neurologic disorders reach their full potential. We serve as a collaborative center of education and support for children and their families living with neurologic conditions. Each year, we select a topic that we believe is important to our community. And in 2019, our annual education initiative was management of disruptive and harmful behaviors. And it was such an important topic that with the support of Greenwich Biosciences and UCB, we have been able to continue behavior management as one of our ongoing programs. In the assessments we conducted last year, we discovered how much behavior impacted families. We also learned that one of the greatest challenges caregivers dealt with was harmful and disruptive behavior brought on by what they believed was a child's difficulty with communication. This feedback inspired today's topic and we are thrilled to have Dr. Christina Grenzer from the Marcus Autism Center to share her expertise on this, on this issue. Dr. Grenzer is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Emory University School of Medicine and a board certified behavior analyst doctorate and program manager for the language and learning program at Marcus Autism Center. She has worked with children with autism spectrum disorder and related disabilities in home, center, and school-based programs targeting skill acquisition and reducing challenging behavior. She completed her postdoctoral fellowship at Marcus Autism Center in the Severe Behavior Program. She holds a doctorate in disability disciplines with a specialization in applied behavior analysis from Utah State University and received her master's in behavior analysis from Western Michigan University. We are very grateful to have Dr. Grenzer joining us today. And before we get started, I just wanna take a minute to let you know we are recording today's webinar. And following the presentation, we will have a brief question and answer session. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A button on your control panel. We will be limiting each person to one question. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to answer all the questions, but we'll do our best to answer the most asked questions. When asking questions, we respectfully ask that you provide a minimum amount of information you feel necessary to respond to your question. Lengthy questions can be difficult to understand and respond to. Also, please keep your questions general in nature. Dr. Grinsler will not be able to provide medical advice related to a specific situation. Thank you, and at this time, I would like to turn things over to Dr. Grinsler. Great, thank you, Cindy. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, so I know this topic is a, is a pretty popular topic, especially with the families that I've worked with. Um, and I bet this is also um, a more needed uh, topic with what's going on in today's world with homeschooling and I'm sure other things that everyone is trying to juggle um, as we're navigating through COVID-19. Um, so today's webinar, I'm hoping to expand your toolbox in reducing challenging behaviors and to replace those challenging behaviors with more appropriate communication skills. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to get an idea of um, who is in attendance today. And so I'd like to start off with a polling question to get to gauge um, what type of role you guys are in. Great, so it looks like there are a lot of caregivers and some family members, some teachers, and a few um, neurologists in attendance today, and a few others. Um, great, and then another question I have is, I'd like to gauge um, if it's your child or um, a member of your family or just patients that you are working with, um, what is the current communication skills that you are seeing them use at this time? Or if it's a patient, maybe more broadly, what types of patients are you seeing? Um, how are they communicating their wants and their needs currently? 
Okay, great. There's a lot of, I think looks a lot of variability. We have some people using one to two words for requests, grabbing or leading by hand or um, seems to be the most. Um, not clearly communi communicating or expressing their needs at this point. Um, and then quite a few saying engaging in challenging behaviors. And I'm guessing maybe the others might be um, individuals that might be communicating um, a little bit more um, than what I specified, but wanting to focus more on children who are kind of classified as more minimally verbal or have limited communication abilities. Great. So just to kind of orient you to the goals that I'd like to accomplish in today's webinar. Um, first, I would like to go over um, what is challenging behavior and why that may be occurring. Um, and then talk about ways that we can replace this challenging behavior by teaching more communication skills um, for children who are minimally verbal. And then as Cindy mentioned um, at the end, we'll have some time to go over some brief um, follow-up questions, but I'm, I'm eager to be able to provide this information to everyone and I hope everyone finds some new tools that they can add to their toolbox um, and to try out. Okay, so um, a big challenge uh, is when a child cannot communicate the things that they most are, uh -oh, are most important to them um, and this can be, um, this can be tough because it is presenting us opportunities where we kind of have to navigate what is it that they're wanting, um, trying to find the right things at the right times. Um, and this can result in some frustration kind of in both parties of the child not being able to effectively communicate what they want or they need. Um, and maybe on a caregiver side where you're trying to figure out what the child wants or needs at a certain point, but maybe not always being able to identify what they're needing. Um, and because of that, sometimes we can see that frustration leading to other challenging behaviors. Um, so it might lead to more um, screaming or crying. It could be um, things more um, aggressive like hitting or kicking. It could lead to more disruptive behaviors, which could be things like throwing, property destruction, um, ripping items. Um, and sometimes it can also lead to more self-injurious behaviors to the child where they might be hitting themselves. Um, or sometimes you see a combination of these types of behaviors kind of rolled in together as a tantrum, or depending on the situation, you might see a few of these behaviors and then it could escalate to some more um, aggressive or disruptive behaviors. Um, so these, these behaviors can be um, very challenging. I'm still not sure, Cindy, if it's letting me navigate or if it's just on a delay. Um, Okay, so this, this can be very um, challenging to be for everyone to navigate. And it, again, it can also be affecting um, the child's ability to access different community events. Um, it can um, be hard for families to go out in the community. Um, children might not be able to participate in camps. Um, it can also affect the child's ability to learn or acquire new skills. Um, and often challenging behavior can place a child in a more restrictive setting. Um, and then it can also cause harm to the child, but also to others. And then another, you know, big part of a big significant impact of these behaviors can really be just on the entire family itself. Um, I know a lot of parents that I've worked with, it can lead to carers being, you know, increased stress levels um, and feelings of isolation if they're not being able to go out in the community or prevents them from doing some of the activities that they would like to be doing with their family and, and children. Um, so with that, you know, it's important for us to find ways that we can reduce these challenging behaviors, but for the child, it's actually, you know, um, a way that they're actually trying to communicate to us, but is, is not in the most desirable way. Um, but they have learned that this is a way that they can try to communicate their wants and needs, which has led to us trying to figure out how we can help them and support them. Um, but that is obviously not the, the 
what we want to happen. Um, so we want today I'll be talking a lot about how can we replace those challenging behaviors with more appropriate ways to start requesting or identifying things that the child wants. Um, so often though, when we are looking to implement some strategies, um, what can happen happen is using a specific strategy for a specific type of behavior. Um, and this approach is often referred to as cookie cutter interventions. Um, these interventions don't actually take into consideration why the behavior is occurring um, or what we'll call is function of the behavior. Um, so for example, if we were to apply some strategies such as like planned ignoring um, or the use of timeout, for a particular instance of challenging behavior. Um, this, if we don't know why or what the child is trying to communicate, we can actually inadvertently reinforce that inappropriate behavior. Um, so instead, we really want to look at the specific variables that are occurring before the behavior, which you might have heard is called the antecedents, um, and then what's happening after the behavior, those consequences, um, in order for us to effectively try to understand so we can change that behavior. Um, and so to help illustrate that a little bit further, I'd like to take us through kind of a little vignette. Um, so in this case, we have Bethany, who is an eight-year-old girl with a developmental delay. Um, she has limited functional communication, and so she's primarily leading her um, caregivers by hand, um, or she may get the items herself. Um, and then in some situations, um, Bethany will um, engage in some aggressive behavior of hitting um, when caregivers take away the iPad or when they tell her she has to brush her teeth. Um, so if we were to look at just the topography, which is refer referred to just the form of the behavior. So in this case, um, the behavior Bethany is engaging is hitting. We were to look at that and prescribe a treatment based on what that behavior looks like. Um, it would look like just applying timeout. So in this situation, every time Bethany hits, then we would implement um, a timeout procedure. And so we'll look at um, how that looks for those different situations. So if we were to apply the timeout for when Bethany hits her caregivers when they try to take away the iPad, um, she may learn that if I hit, not only do I not get my iPad, but I also don't get anything else um, preferred at this time. Um, in the second example though, you see if Bethany hits her caregivers after being told to brush her teeth, um, if she goes to time out in this situation, what Bethany might learn is that when I hit, then I can get out of not having to brush my teeth. Um, and so this shows kind of the importance why we want to look at the different circumstances. So a, a specific behavior could be occurring for different reasons depending on that situation. Um, so the first situation, that would be a desirable outcome that we would want Bethany to learn. But in the second situation, we would not want her to learn that hitting would get her out of that demand. Um, and so instead, what we really need to figure out is that reason why, why she engaged in that behavior. And then we can um, apply a more function-based, a treatment approach. So then once we know um, a certain con consequence is, a, is, is maintaining a problem behavior, we can then apply an individualized specific treatment to address that situation. So let's look at what an, that example would be for Bethany. Um, in that first instance, you see that hitting could be maintained by getting access to a preferred item, the iPad, um, and then we would implement um, a timeout procedure for the consequence if she engaged in hitting. But in the second example, instead of using timeout, we would then implement a different consequence um, by following through the demand. Um, so we already know if we did the timeout, we have that same um, outcome happening. But now that we apply a more function-based approach to the second outcome, instead of using timeout, um, having the caregivers follow through with that demand, then Bethany would learn that even if I hit, I would still have to brush my teeth. 
Um, and that would be an, um, important for her to learn so that way she's not trying to generalize that behavior to maybe other situations that you're asking um, a demand. Um, so obviously, um, that's easier said than done sometimes. And um, just want to highlight kind of an, an example of that all of our children's behavior also has an impact on our behavior too. And sometimes it can create a kind of a cycle um, that we have to look at to figure out what's going on and trying to find strategies that we can break that cycle. So we'll, t we'll go through um, another example. Um, so in, in this situation, um, again, a, a caregiver takes away an iPad, um, a child may start screaming, um, depending on where you're at, this might be something that you might not be able to allow happen. So in this instance, the caregiver gives back the iPad and the child starts to calm down. Um, and so the child stops screaming. Um, and so there's two things that we can kind of learn from this example. Um, one, this can be very effective by giving the iPad back that the, the child would stop screaming um, and calm down. Um, and depending on the situation, that sometimes has to happen. But then also that what the child can learn is that screaming can get me back my items. Um, and that can be a very effective way to ask and communicate that they want to keep their items. Um, but once we have a better understanding of that reason why, we can really then start to figure out how can we change the environment or provide um, new skills for the child to be able to teach a replacement behavior. So in this case, instead of screaming, we could teach the child to ask for the iPad or have more time on the iPad. Um, but often, sometimes the iPad does have to be removed. Um, and so another thing that we might have to teach is tolerating periods of time without the iPad, um, periods of time doing other different activities. Um, and that can be um, different skills that we need to work on teaching so we can then be um, working towards those more appropriate behaviors um, during these different situations. So um, through kind of these little vignettes, um, I hope that what we've learned so far is that there are different reasons or what we call functions um, for why behaviors occur. Um, and this includes all behavior. Um, so we're focusing more on challenging behavior and why they might occur. But in the science of um, behavior analysis, all behavior we engage in has some sort of purpose. So all the things that we engage in um, throughout the day, we do because it serves some sort of purpose. Um, and so things that our, our children and our, our patients are doing, they also serve some sort of purpose. And so it's our job to figure out what is that purpose that it's serving and see if there's something else that we can replace it with if it's not something that is currently desirable. Um, and so this lists just the, the top functions that could possibly occur. Um, oftentimes it could be engaging in behaviors to get access to attention. Um, this can be a very common one for when um, caregivers have to divert their attention to other children, to different um, tasks um, that can kind of trigger some other ways for a child to communicate that they want back attention. Um, it could also be to access different preferred items or activities that they would want to keep or to gain access to. Um, and then another uh, uh, one is to escape or avoid difficult situations, um, things that are aversive, things that I don't want to do. Um, can also be a, a, a strong function of behavior. And then the last one is um, what we call automatic reinforcement. And so this is something that is more um, internal. It's not something that we can necessarily always control or see. Um, and oftentimes you might hear this more as like sensory seeking behavior. Um, this is also something that all of us engage in too at various levels. So this can be like simply um, tapping your foot. Um, or it could be something um, more problematic too for depending on um, the child. Um, but today we're going to be focusing more on the top two, um, access to attention and access to preferred items or activities. 
and going over some strategies on how we can replace maybe the challenging behavior that might be occurring as a function um, for these um, with something more appropriate. Um, but it's also important to note that um, not all behavior is as clean as what I've kind of described. Sometimes it can be um, what we call multiply maintained. And so a child's behavior um, may have multiple functions and it could also change over time. So it's important for you to consider the variables that are happening um, in these different circumstances and trying to play that detective to see what is it that they're trying to, to communicate to you. And, and so just to see, make sure to see if we have a good kind of understanding and grasp of functions of behavior. Um, I have this slide here that will do another polling question um, of a little vignette and I'd like you guys to um, read that and see if you can um, determine what is the function of Bethany's behavior in this situation. All right, we have a few answers of access to attention and access to preferred items. Um, so yeah, that is great. Um, so what we're what the main function in this example is really access to preferred items, that candy. Um, and I don't know why stores torture parents with having the candy and all these favorite things at the checkout line because it's just a disaster. Um, but in the a few people also said attention, and that's also possible that sometimes even some of the attention that in this situation the parent is giving to the child, um, even though it's negative attention, could also function um, as a way to get attention from the caregiver if their attention was probably diverted at that um, checkout line. Um, and so this could be also an example of both, um, but predominantly would be trying to get access to that preferred um, item. Um, so, um, just to note, like the most precise way to actually identify the function of behavior, um, it can be can be done by collecting a formal functional behavior an assessment, um, and this is something that often schools do um, or other trained professionals in behavior analysis. Um, but today, you are also hopefully learning some skills where you can start to hypothesize what might be the functions of what children are communicating um, because then you can still start making strides to make some changes to help them communicate that in a different way. And so these are some helpful questions that you can kind of ask yourself to get a better understanding of maybe what your child is communicating. Um, so having that question right there, what are they trying to tell me in this situation? Um, looking for does this challenging behavior occur more frequently in certain times places or settings um, what would happen if you were to restrict a, a preferred item would that result in some challenging behavior um, or fill in that with like what about if you restricted your attention do you find that restricting your attention um, can be a challenge for your child um, or is it also just presenting maybe some demands um, you could ask what are some times and situations where when problem behavior never occurs? This can be helpful because if it never occurs when they are engaged in a preferred activity, um, then it might that not it might not be to gain access to those preferred items. You might see it when it's um, going to present a demand or um, in different circumstances. Um, and then the, another question can be, what can you do to guarantee problem behavior? Um, and that can be very helpful to know, like if you were, did this one thing and problem behavior occurred, you can start kind of figuring out the pieces of like, what is that child communicating in that situation? Um, so this is also something I just wanted to make sure everyone is aware of that, um, even in light of COVID where you might be doing some hybrid school or some online school, I know it can be very um, difficult and I'm not sh I'm sure everyone is experiencing different challenges, but this is something that you can ask for help with um, a part of a child who is receiving special education services. If, if problem behavior is interfering with their ability to learn new skills, this is something that that school could help you um, assess and be able to help then find a more function based intervention to really target how to address those challenging behaviors. 
Um, so after we have identified um, that um, that your child is maybe communicating um, is related to difficulties in that communicating. They may be using other ways to communicate that. Um, we'll want to then determine how can we change that to something um, more more appropriate. Um, and we can look for opportunities to teach a replacement behavior um, for them to receive that same outcome. So if they're wanting to gain access to preferred items or your attention or get a break from something that's difficult, we can teach them under these situations um, to ask for that item or ask for a break um, and then work from there to teach more tolerance as well. So before we start talking about how to actually teach a different um, response, I wanted to spend a little time talking about the different ways that a child could communicate. Um, so there's different um, communication forms um, or modalities that a child could use. Um, often, it's we you know we use um, speech, but that is sometimes not something that, although most common, may not be um, applicable for a child for various reasons. Um, but there are a lot of different types of forms that can also be very effective to get to communicate um, different wants and needs. And so, you could be something through just some vocal approximations. Um, it could be using some sign language, so signing for something that you would want. Um, it could be using pictures um, and, and exchanging pictures to communicate things that you need. Um, it can also be something that's a little bit more high tech um, using a speech generating device. Um, and it can also be um, simply um, pointing or um, eye contact or eye gaze, um, depending on where your child's at. Um, so when trying to select a modality, it's, it is important to consider um, where your child is at currently, um, knowing what their kind of strengths and weaknesses are, um, and looking at what kind of motor abilities they may have. Um, so for example, if you were to consider teaching um, a child to use sign language, um, there's some great pros with that as it's very portable, it's something that they already have on them. Um, but that can also be challenging if a child does not have the gross or fine motor um, skills to be able to form those different communication responses with their hand. Um, and it's also something that might be really great in um, their own community, but it might limit their communication to other people who are not as familiar with sign language. Um, you could also consider maybe like pictures um, and using a picture book. Um, but this would mean like that uh, picture book or maybe a device as needs to be traveling with the child. And so there's just some additional things that you might have to teach the child to um, pick up their book and travel with them. Um, and then with that, you also need to consider your child's ability to be able to scan different pictures um, and being able to understand that these pictures represent different items. Um, so if your child is not able to kind of make the connection that a, this picture might represent this 3D item. Um, there might be some additional prerequisite skills that we'd want to work on first um, before transitioning into that modality. Um, but what's really important to know is when, when selecting an initial form of communication that what we want to do right now is to find something that can be um, relatively easy for your child and then as they become more successful, we can kind of expand the complexity of that, that communication modality. Um, but first, we want to make it easy so it's something that they um, can be more successful at um, very quickly and then not having to revert to maybe engaging in challenging behavior. Um, so I'd like to start with um, another polling question. Um, just would like to gauge what kind of communication modality that you would be most likely to start teaching your child or recommend for a patient um, so I can kind of provide more specific examples while we go through how to actually teach. Okay, great. So it looks like there's um, a large percentage for looking for some um, vocal requests, maybe some vocal approximations, um, a few sign language, and then a lot that is selecting picture exchange or a speech generating device. 
Great, so I'll try to highlight some examples um, focused related to picture exchange and some vocal approximations, um, but we can also do some follow-up um, with any additional questions at the end too. Um, so once we have a good understanding what the child is trying to communicate, that function of that problem behavior, um, we've identified what type of modality we want to teach. So let's say picture exchange. Um, then we're ready to start actually teaching that replacement behavior. So here are just kind of the nuts and bolts um, for teaching um, a request that will teach to replace that challenging behavior. And we're going to go over each of these step by step um, with the goal of hoping that you'll be able to try this out on your own. Um, so that, oops, sorry, so that first step, um, we wanted to look for indicating responses. Um, and so these are actually just a variety of different behaviors that can give you some clues um, to when your child is wanting or needing something. Um, and this can be a variety of different things depending on, on your child, but what you want to um, become, you want to become a, an expert of looking for these observing responses um, as that they will actually tell you that this is a good time that you can try to teach this new communication response. Um, so it could look like um, simply reaching for items. Um, it could be pointing for them. Um, it could be simply orienting towards something and you may see changes in facial expressions, um, looking at the item, um, getting that, trying to get the item themselves. And then um, as we're talking about a lot of challenging behavior, this could also look for some what we call precursors, um, which are like little signs that are happening before maybe that big tantrum or before that bigger outburst. So this could be things like whining, um, starting to see some more agitation in their body, maybe rocking their body, um, other inappropriate vocalizations. Those would be good indications that there's maybe some signs of frustration going on and that you can come in and provide this as an opportunity to teach that replacement behavior um, before any other challenging behavior occurs. And so just take a few seconds to think of what might be the types of indicating responses that your child may have. Um, and then we'll go, get ready to go on to the next step. Okay, so once you know, okay, my child is trying to communicate something to me, you see these indicating behaviors. Um, next step is that you'll want to provide a prompt to help the, that communication response. Um, and so this prompt is something that we call, um, as a fancy way of just saying that you're providing some sort of support to help your child engage in that communication response correctly. Um, and these prompts can be a variety of different supports depending on the communication response that you're teaching. And it can also depend on what's most effective for your, your individual child. And so what at this stage, what we want is that prompt to help lead your child to requesting the item um, correctly, but also quickly. So we, we really don't want to have them to have the opportunity to fail um, and have a chance to communicate um, anything through maybe some more challenging behaviors. So we want it to be very quick and very effective to help them engage in that response. And then over time, we will we'll talk about how you'll we'll want to fade those um, supports out so where the child is learning to communicate on their own. Um, so these prompts though can look like um, some physical guidance. So if you're teaching picture exchange, it might be having, um, generally we start off with just a single picture and working on teaching that communication skill, of being able to pick up the picture, reach and release it into the communication partner's hand. Um, and oftentimes you might have to do some more hand over hand guidance to be able to teach that skill and then gradually fade out those physical prompts. So maybe you're just providing a little bit of guidance, but then they're doing the response mostly by themselves. Um, for other communication modalities, um, if you're wanting to try to do some vocal approximations, you can also provide a model prompt or sometimes called an imitative prompt. Um, and you can provide a vocal model if you're trying to teach a child to request, oh, they want some juice, you can provide that vocal prompt juice or maybe something um, more short like ja and have them repeat that to tell you that they want juice. 
Um, or if you're doing a sign, um, it could be good. You can use a model prompt of showing exactly how you would sign juice. Um, and then the child would copy you and then you would be able to teach that communication response. And so there's a variety of different ways that you can um, prompt and sometimes you're going to combine a few of, of these things. Um, what's important to know is that it may take some time um, for your child to kind of learn or catch on about what you're trying to do with them and trying to teach that communication response. And it also might take you some time to kind of figure out like what's the most effective um, prompt that you can provide to help your child engage in that communication response too. Um, so it'll be some trial and error, um, but things that you would want to look out for is that if you're trying to prompt that communication response and the child is not participating, they're becoming um, lack of engagement, or maybe they're trying to move somewhere else, um, this could be a sign that of two different things. One, that maybe they are no longer interested in maybe an item or activity that you're going to try to help them request for. Um, and so that motivation has shifted. Um, and so you would want to, at that point, kind of abandon and then see where your child is going next to see if you can create another opportunity to maybe request for something different. Um, or it could also be an indication that maybe the communication response that you're, you're trying to teach right now might be um, a little bit too difficult. And so you might want to then consider choosing something a little bit easier um, to start initially. And then as you build some more history and the child learns how effective that this way can be, you can start um, increasing that response requirement into something more, um, more complex. Um, so often when I'm working with children here in the clinic, we really start um, early on with just making sure that they can consistently point to things because um, that can be very effective. Everyone can understand a point, um, but then there's also limitations to when you're pointing for something that's like out of sight or out of reach or I don't know where, um, then that can lead to kind of doing some more guessing games and can lead to some frustration. Um, so then the next step after pointing would be trying to find um, a more complex communication response such as picture exchange, if they might be um, more minimally verbal or working towards providing some vocal um, opportunities too. But if vocal communication is um, challenging, um, and when you're working on it, you're seeing lots of challenging behavior. Um, that's when I would recommend trying to um, reduce that response requirement and kind of find ways to build back up to that. All right, so then the next step, once you've identified um, your prompt, um, following that prompt, so once your child successfully follows your, your support, um, this is when you would want to immediately give the child the item that they've requested or the attention that they may be asking for. Um, and by doing this, we are, we're then going to be reinforcing this new response of requesting um, that they just engaged in. Um, and the goal is to make this um, more likely to occur, fall in your prompts, or hopefully starting to follow um, on their own. Um, so it is really important that you give that the item or whatever you're working on teaching them to request for, whether it's an item, your attention, or maybe a break from something, that you give it to them right away, even though um, right now you're teaching them, and so it could be just right away after you've prompted them. Because um, then again, we'll, we'll talk in just a minute about how you'll eventually fade out those supports um, until your child becomes more and more independent. Um, but they initially are going to need a lot more um, practice opportunities and having that support that you're providing. Um, and then by establishing this, um, our goal in here is to be quick with it because we want to create a history of that when the child communicates, they get what they want right away, he communicates, he gets what he wants right away and kind of repeating this um, over time so we can again break that previous connection of maybe between using problem behavior as that communicative response. Um, and then following the, the delivery of that item, some other things that you can do to just help provide some language enriched environment that can help with like other skills as well is providing the name of that item. So if they're asking for something specific, um, when you deliver that item, for example, juice, then you can say juice. That's right, you ask for juice or here's some more juice. Um, and this helps them establish a connection between 
uh, maybe even like the picture that they're using or what they're what they, they see in front of them that this item has a name um, and then can help make that connection as well for them. Um, and then lastly, throughout that process too, we also want to provide a lot of um, um, enthusiasm and praise when the child is successfully following the prompt. Um, this is especially helpful um, as you're starting because we want to make this um, a very fun learning experience for them, um, as well as it's showing them and giving them feedback that this is what you want to see more from them um, and showing that yes, keep doing this and showing that approval to hopefully shift the response more to this more desirable way of communicating um, and giving them other tools to communicate rather than maybe reverting to some more challenging behavior. And then, as I mentioned, then the next step would be after you've been um, teaching your child a little bit, you found a successful prompt for them to engage in that response. Um, the next step is to really start to find ways that you can fade that support because the ultimate goal is that we want the child to be able to independently ask and tell us when they need something. Um, so again, this can look a little bit different though, depending on the communication um, form that you're teaching. Um, so for those who are more interested in teaching like a picture exchange um, or, or using a speech generating device, this might start off with providing some more hand over hand guidance, but then we quickly want to try to move to less physical guidance and more of the child doing the response. Um, and so that could be fading your prompts and to the point where you're maybe just gently guiding them um, into different partial physical guidance. Um, you may even just be shadowing them or guiding them to their device or their book um, to kind of show them like, look, communicate this way to eventually to the point where they're doing it themselves. Um, if you're doing things that are um, of, of like a sign, you could be more predominantly using a model prompt. These ones are a little bit harder to um, fade out. So this one would look a little bit different where you may provide several models and then provide an opportunity for the child to do it themselves. Um, or you may see that you provide a model and your child is really close, but maybe not quite. And so you might have to use some modeling plus some physical guidance to help them form that um, that sign to be able to match it exactly um, with you. And then for vocal um, requests, this can also be providing um, a full vocal prompt. So if it's a full thing, you could say the whole word, so juice, and then the child would repeat it. Um, or sometimes you can simply kind of like start by providing a little reminder, like, oh, we're holding up the juice, it starts just and then that might trigger them to, um, just a little little vocal prompt to then fill it in with the full approximation of juice. Um, but just all in all, what, what we want to look for is that they're starting to respond with the help of your prompt. You're seeing that they're kind of like outgrowing that prompt. Um, and then now you, will, you can provide um, a couple times, you might prompt a couple times in a row and then provide an independent opportunity to see if they can do it themselves. Um, so after you've prompted, you may wait a few seconds, um, probably about like three to five seconds. Um, if they're starting to engage in the response and you may like wait a little bit longer, but about after three to five seconds is a good indication whether they're, they're gonna be able to do the response on their own or if they're gonna need help. Um, and so if you see that they're not doing it on their own, then you'll go ahead and quickly jump in and provide that um, prompt again um, and still provide that item in praise and attention um, when they um, request using that prompt. Um, but if they do end up doing it actually by themselves, then that's where we wanna throw a huge party, really show that yes, you did it by yourself, provide lots of praise, um, and then you may want to provide a little bit more of that item or more of your attention um, to really reinforce that them doing it on, the, on their own um, and start then withholding the, the amount of it when you're, when you're having to help them. And so you'll want to repeat the sequence um, throughout, um, and this could be throughout a day, this might be throughout multiple days, depending on your child, but providing opportunities to teach the skill, but then providing a little bit of a wait time to see, hey, can they do it on their own? Um, because we don't want them to then become 
um, prompt dependent on us helping them communicate. We really want them to initiate that communication and be spontaneous. So the faster we can provide, fade out those supports, um, the better. Sorry, I should have clicked on this slide that we just went over. Um, and so next up though would be to track progress. Um, and so this can be very helpful um, is to, to know that, you know, each child is going to have um, different learning paces. Um, so for some children, by showing them um, just a few times by providing those few prompted trials, you might be able to start see um, independent requests happening pretty quickly. Um, but then for other children, it may take them, you know, hundreds of trials of practicing too. Um, and so if you continue to follow these procedures consistently, providing those prompts and then fading them out, um, you should still see improvements um, and see a reduction in instances of problem behavior. Um, so I wanna say like, don't give up, hold, hold tight and, um, and keep trying to keep practice. Um, but what can be helpful is to also track some progress to know, um, are, you, are you starting to see progress as well? Because sometimes progress can be um, hard to see um, if, if a child is needing a little bit more time. Um, you might forget where you're at and then several days later, um, and that can be helpful because we also want to continue to move the move the response requirement for the child to as independent as possible. So if you jot down, hey, I was able to, you know, provide a less intrusive physical prompt today and what that looked like, that could be a helpful prompt just for yourself too. So when you find opportunities to teach the next day, or if you have someone else that's helping provide different opportunities to practice, they can start at that um, prompt as well. Um, and then just noting maybe how many times you're seeing your child request independently. Um, so you might see that they're really able to ask for something um, really strong for one thing, but then, you know, you're teaching another um, same requesting skill, but for like a different item or a different circumstance. Um, and then for like more vocalizations, it's helpful to track um, the best approximation that you've heard. And so that way you can continue to work on improving um, articulation skills over time, but often it's gonna take lots and lots of practice um, before you might get to something um, all the way to that terminal um, full word that you're looking for. Um, um, and then it's also good to, to also note that like with, with learning, um, your child is gonna have like good days and bad days too. So there might be times where you feel like, oh, we're really, my child's really understanding this, he's getting it. Um, but then the next day you feel like you might be a kind of backslide. Um, this is all a typical learning process. And then again, just continue to stick with it, be consistent with your expectations um, and go through those maybe more challenging days, um, but really continue to work on uh, on this requesting skill and, and tracking it will allow you to kind of help and persist with that as well. Um, and so I'd like to end with just a few more things to kind of consider. So you have kind of the, the steps that we went over, you identify the, the type of modality, you look for those indicating responses to provide that help, that prompt, provide that item right away, um, and then over time, you're going to fade your prompts. Um, but and some other things to consider would be starting small and also just focusing on a few main categories. So if your child really, really likes your attention and that's where you're struggling, really focusing maybe just on teaching how they can request to access more attention from other people. Um, if your child really likes a specific iPad um, item, sorry, iPad is what came to mind because that's what everyone's favorite thing is right now, but sometimes it's also the most challenging because it can be the most challenging to withhold. So it could be a really good item to start with because they're super motivated for that item, but it also can maybe lead to some problems because it's so powerful. And so you might wanna look for something that's a little bit more secondary where they still really like, um, but it can be something that you can withhold a little bit easier to start practicing. Because um, our goal is that we really want to be um, having more successful trials outnumber the unsuccessful ones. 
And then we just want to watch out for over prompting. Um, and so I just want to note that we want to try to avoid using the phrase like, what do you want? Um, it's okay to be using that sometimes, but we also want the child to learn that under this circumstance, when I'm feeling this way and I'm getting frustrated or I can't get something, this is how I use this new um, behavior and how I can get what I want. Um, and instead of waiting for an adult to provide this, like, this prompt of what do you want. And then as you're teaching, another thing to look for is just making sure that you're providing more reinforcement or more reward for independent responses. And that can be um, independent versus prompted or for some kids looking for things that are less prompted. So you're giving more of that item for prompts that you're just helping a little bit um, and withholding not as much when you're having to help as much. So you continue to change the re response requirement and, and moving your child to more and more independent responses. Because if they can just get the same quantity of the item with you helping them, then they may, you might see them be stuck and kind of staying stagnant at that level. So trying to figure out how can you move that needle a little bit more. Um, and then another thing to consider is just that throughout this process, you know, there could be sometimes where challenging behavior might, might pop up during this teaching as well. Um, and so that to remember is that we want to select something that is going to be easy for them to communicate initially um, to reduce that likelihood and then build upon that. Um, but what we, what we don't want to do is then reinforce that challenging behavior. So we don't want um, at this point, we're trying to break that connection from um, hitting and maybe getting something I like or hitting and getting out of something. We want to intervene before that hitting happens. So that's where you want to look at for the, the precursor behaviors um, that we discussed as like indicating responses. So looking for things that are a little bit more mild that are starting to clue you in that, hey, my child's getting frustrated. They need something. How can I help them um, and provide that prompt before it escalates? Um, and then other things to consider is that sometimes you might see some challenging behavior because you're trying to teach the, your child to request, but while you're teaching them, they've actually shifted and they're like, nope, I don't want that item anymore. Um, and that's okay. It's just looking for those signs and then um, following your child to see if you can create a new opportunity with something else. Um, and then again, considering is, is the response that I'm choosing too difficult um, and can I make it a little bit easier for them initially? And then with this, um, it's important that this is a, to, remember, to remind yourself that this is a new skill that we're trying to teach. And so it is going to take time. And that's sometimes hard because we want to see changes happen quickly, but um, for children, it can take sometimes a long time. But if we're persistent, this will be um, something that we can change over time. Um, and another thing to consider is that, you know, here we've kind of talked a little bit more about finding more natural opportunities that a child is presenting with these indicating responses and for you to um, provide that prompt. But you can also create more practice opportunities throughout the day as well. Um, this can be really great for items that your child, um, that you can deliver in smaller quantities that they can still be really interested in. Um, it could be also just moving things in your house that are usually that are easy for them to get, but more maybe out of reach or out of sight. Um, this could also be enticing with different items that they may be interested to kind of get them interested in that activity. And you might then see like, oh, wait, I want that. Um, and those can be all times that you contrive opportunities to kind of practice that skill. Um, my favorite to really work on teaching is if a child um, really enjoys bubbles. That can be a really great activity that you can control. You can deliver the bubbles, but then once they pop, you can have another opportunity to, um, to create an opportunity for requesting for more bubbles and then continue that activity again. Um, other items that are a little bit harder, I think, are like the iPad, where children tend to want longer amounts of times on the iPad. So those ones you might not be as able to get as many trials done. So if you can find items where you can practice more, that can just give your child more opportunities to be able to practice and learn that skill um, throughout the day if you have time. 
So that is all I have for you guys today. Um, I hope this provides um, some good starting points to really start diving into exploring like why is your child communicating and what they're trying to communicate. Um, so that function piece and then finding out ways that you can start trying to replace that um, with some form of other um, appropriate communication through a, a variety of modalities. And so I think we'll turn it over to some um, potential questions. Yes. Uh, thank you. That was excellent. I learned a lot and really appreciate uh, you taking the time. So starting with a few questions. One is how long should I practice? Uh, is it daily? How many hours? I can't do it all day. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it, I think it varies on like what you're able to do. Um, I always like to recommend starting small um, and trying to practice just a few minutes each day if you can, or even setting a goal like where I can't do it every day during the week, but I can do a lot of practices on the weekends. Um, I think it's best just to individualize on what you think you can do. And then as you start practicing, you'll notice probably that you're able to create like a lot more opportunities throughout the day than you even realize, but just having these kind of practice times and then during times maybe where you're not um, practicing, these might be times where to help reduce challenging behavior, you may want to give more free access to the items um, so they have them. And then during times where you're gonna practice, trying to make it really fun and spending a few t few minutes each day just working on requesting it. Great. Uh, the next question is, do you have recommendations if other people in the household aren't following the strategies? For instance, a spouse or a sibling that gives them what they want whenever they want it. Yes, that is that can be very challenging. Um, what I encourage is trying to find ways where like both parents can like participate in training. I know sometimes it's hard when one family member maybe attends a training and then it's like, great, I learned all of this great tools, we're gonna start doing it. But then that other partner maybe doesn't have the same knowledge um, and it's hard to provide the knowledge to your partner in the same way without maybe having some confrontation. Um, but if, if it's possible for them to maybe watch this module recording later, that could be a good, good way. Um, so you guys can have more of a team approach. Um, but also children also learn um, what they have to do with different people. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't discourage you from practicing also just initially with yourself um, and then trying to find ways to engage other family members or partners or um, to participate when you can, um, maybe after you're demonstrating that, look, you know, our child can do this skill in, in trying to change that expectation. Um, but it can be, I think, challenging for, for families to navigate when not everyone is always on the same page. Um, right. But we do know, like, you know, kids will like, I'll go to dad because dad will let me do this, or I'll go to mom because she'll let me do this. So they, the children are very smart. And even if they can't communicate exactly at, um, as effectively right now, they still pick up on those strategies um, as well. Right. Uh, another person said they're looking at trialing the Toby eye gaze for their son. Have you heard of this? Any feedback? I have heard of that. Um, I'm not as um, familiar with eye gazing, um, but so I can't say if it's, I can't recommend if it's good or not. Um, but I have heard of that kind of company and I know they've done, I think some also more like speech generating devices too that I've seen children have. Um, I think what's good to remember um, there is just trying to find ways, like obviously the prompting for eye gaze would be a little bit different um, and having to start maybe very small with just learning and teaching the eye gaze to maybe a certain preferred activity and practicing being able to look at hey, here's this picture, this picture is representing this item. And then as a child becomes more 
um, has learned what to do, make that connection between looking and getting, then starting to add more pictures to that visual array and start teaching that meaning for, you know, this eye gaze would give you access to this one, um, or guy gazing over here would give you access to this item, trying to make sure that they're able to discriminate between those different visual icons and getting that um, item that they are, are seeking. Right. Uh, I think this might be our last question. Maybe we can get to in. Uh, what do you do about access when the answer is no? So they're pointing, they're using their tools, but it's still no. Yes, that one's that one is tough. Um, that it that goes. You kind of see like two different ways. Um, initially, if possible, you want to try to select when you're practicing things that you don't have to necessarily restrict too much because we really want to teach them that I ask, I get, I ask, I get. Um, and if, I, if that's not being effective, then it's possible that they'll try to use other ways that in the past have been effective. Um, but then the problem is that, yeah, you can't always be getting everything that you ask all the time. And so working on teaching tolerance to not being able to have it um, and it might be teaching just brief periods of time where you, you don't get to have it and then, oh, now this time you do. Um, so really working on increasing like the length of time a child can have access to something. But it's also just a skill that you need, that they would also need to practice. So making sure when you've said no, it's not available, that you're able to follow through with that no. Um, if you say no and problem behavior happens and it starts to escalate and you then provide the item, then that child, again, is learning potentially that this challenging behavior at this level is going to allow me to get what I want. Um, so it might then be the next day they may use that as well. Um, and if it's something that is very harmful to the child or to others, that's when I would recommend having someone do a more in-depth assessment to make sure we really understand that function and getting some support on how you can kind of work through that in a safe way. And that goes perfectly into the next and final question is, how do I find someone who's trained how to do this well? That is a good question. Um, it definitely depends on um, probably where you're, where you're living. Um, there's definitely more resources um, in certain areas than others. Um, there is, um, I would recommend first starting with your school if possible. Um, I think the schools and the teachers should be able to have some resources that they can also help you with. Um, and usually often there's people within the school that could also provide resources for extra things within the community. Um, you could also look for behavior, um, behavior analysts within your community. If you actually Google just the um, board certified behavior analysis department, you can look for um, people with that credential within your region um, and you could reach out to them or uh, Google them and see if there's someone that could kind of help you with that process as well. Awesome. I'm going to take one more. Uh, my daughter, three-year-old nonverbal, bites when in pain. Do you have any suggestions to redirect this behavior? Currently, I say no and put her down on the ground, but I'm not yielding any sustained changes in behavior. Um, yeah, so this one, I wouldn't be able to provide exactly um, specific advice, but I think something, if you um, are thinking that the function is because of that they're in pain, I would first want to know, you know, what, what kind of pain, um, is this like an underlying medical condition that could be something that could be fixed. Um, I know I've um, worked with families who, you know, their, their child may have engaged in some more self-harm behavior and then we found out that, oh, it was due to like a, a cavity in their mouth um, and getting that removed helped fix that problem. Um, but really trying to figure out if there's some underlying medical condition um, to really rule that out first. Um, because pain is hard to know because it's something that's happening in, internally. Um, and so that gets a little bit tricky on, on how to identify what's exactly going on. Great, thank you. So on that, unfortunately, we have to end today. I'm sorry, a little bit over, but on half on behalf of the Child Neurology Foundation and our partners, I'd like to thank each of you for your participation in today's event. We hope you found the information helpful. I know I did. Uh, we'll be posting a recording of this event online and we'll email you a link 
to anyone who's registered for our webinar. And also we will send a link to our behavior webpage where we have several videos and other tools to help with behavior management. And with that, I hope you will complete the survey that will pop up at the end of this event and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks everyone.